Let's imagine that I come from one of the many alternative futures. In my future, we've just finished the term of Siri, our first AI president. It's about 20 years from now. And in this future, edge cities, those cities that have grown up on the edge of metropolitan areas like Tyson's, have been good stewards of the resources that they've built over time, the jobs and the infrastructure. And in this future, they've humanized those resources. They've turned the streets into pedestrian-oriented streets. They've built great neighborhoods. They've built great parks. And in this future, they've turned some of those neighborhoods into eco-districts. And by creating eco-districts, they've unleashed resilience and equitable access to resources in the concrete jungle. Now, eco-districts use principles from the real jungle, and they apply them at the scale of the district or neighborhood. So it's bigger than an individual green building, but it's smaller than the city. And principles of the jungle mean things like there's no such thing as waste, all waste is food for something else, there's equal access to resources and everything depends on everything else, so the leopard depends on the dung beetle and vice versa. And there's resilience. When a big tree falls, an army of small trees reach up for the sun. Eco-districts combine the infrastructure and the individual buildings, the acts of individuals and the acts of community to bring out that resilience. And they do that within a framework of social equity that allows them to take some of the profits and some of the value that's created in infrastructure and utilize that in social programs that deal with other aspects of the community. And it's that framework that kind of keeps this from being a, a sort of geeky infrastructure play. Now, Right now, communities that are in your time trying to become eco-districts are following a journey that's set out in a protocol that's been published by the national nonprofit organization, Eco Districts. And there are 15 or 20 of these going forward around the country. There are three of them in the District of Columbia, and one of them with really ambitious goals is the Southeast Eco District. But each one of those is in a city. And for a long time, I thought that was the only place that an eco-district could occur was in the city because that's where we've got the densities, that's where we've concentrated waste. So there's typically in the city a big waste pipe full of sewage, a big pipe full of stormwater, a big landfill, and so it makes economic sense to go and tap those wastes. The suburbs may in fact create more waste, but it's all spread out so that it's not really economical to tap into it. But then, the edge cities step forward. And they say, well, technically, we're in the suburbs, but we've concentrated people and we've concentrated waste. Couldn't we be that eco-district? And the answer is yes, but what would it look like? What would be the difference between an edge city neighborhood and an edge city eco-district? I think maybe one way to determine that is to look through the eyes of a resident. So we're going to look through the eyes of Elliot. And Elliot's 20 years old. In fact, baby Elliot may be here tonight. <laughs> Elliot manages the urban agriculture for Edge City Eco District. And in that job, he manages the workers who are working between the buildings raising food. He also manages the tool lending program by which you can come and get tools to grow food on your balcony and on your roof. He also manages the robots that are working in the former parking decks, raising food. Except for the underground parking decks, those are secure pot farms and he doesn't mess with those. Elliot manages teams that use uh, reuse water to water the crops, harvest rainwater. They use alternative energy to power the equipment they use, and they compost their waste. And they use that compost and vermiculture, they cultivate earthworms, to grow living soil. And that is soil that actually is full of happy bugs and beasties, and they create nutrients, and those nutrients allow the plants to grow without the addition of fertilizers. And because they're not using fertilizers, the streams in Eco District 
come back to life. They also don't use herbicides and pesticides. And because they're not using herbicides and pesticides, the residents are healthier. And it also allows a rich fabric of pollinators and birds and wildlife to reinfiltrate around the buildings. In fact, Elliot's friend Katiri manages the biophilic health program. And that program allows the residents of the eco district to access the wildlife, to participate through cameras, and to know when the coyotes or the cougars come into town, and to understand you know, what the birth uh, of a species would be. It's a very popular program. Subscribers, are, there are groupies for different animals within the town. Other friends of Elliot's manage the harvest program. And they use surface drones and air drones to distribute fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, fish from the urban agriculture co-op into the restaurants, into the homes, and into the food trucks that move throughout the city. Because of these programs, the Edge City Eco District imports very little food. And if there's a catastrophic circumstance, if something bad happens, it can actually go for weeks without having to bring food in. Elliot's very happy there. He loves his job. In fact, he came to the Eco District because of that job. Elliot actually is a brilliant programmer, and he could have been at any tech hub in the country. And he does side hustles to get money whenever he wants it, but what he loves is to be working outside as part of the urban agriculture program. His expenses are low because they're in the eco district. He doesn't need a car. His utilities come from the uh, uh, grid, from the microgrid that's there in the, in, in the eco district. His water comes from the one water facility that harvests rainwater, uses reuse water, and figures out the most economical way to deliver water inside the bounds of the eco district. Sometimes when Elliot's standing out in the field, he looks up at this one particular tower and he tracks one particular window, and that connects him to the other reason that he came there to the eco district, and that's his mom. And his mom is the CEO of Monolithic. Monolithic relocated its world headquarters from New York to this edge city because about three years ago, a hurricane hit New York. And when it hit, it knocked Monolithic offline. So Monolithic's world headquarters were out of touch with the world. For three weeks, they lost millions of dollars. His mom says it's never going to happen again. She's the one who taught Elliot about the eco district and resilience. She moved Monolithic to the edge city eco district the first thing she did was she tapped into the grid, the microgrid that used the solar energy, the wind energy, and the geothermal from the eco district. A few weeks ago, a hurricane hit the eco district. And everything has played out exactly the way Elliot's mom thought it would. First, they were able to stay online because of that energy. They were also able to outlast everyone who stayed online using diesel generators. Diesel ran out. You couldn't get more diesel in. She'd also set it up so they would be participating in the water program, and they would have reuse water to have the toilets working, the heat and the cooling, the landscaping. They would filter rainwater, and they'd be able to continue operating. But she knew that a hospital or a world headquarters couldn't actually operate with just energy and water, it needed people. And she was concerned that something crazy might happen, like the metro might not work, or the interstate would catch on fire, and her people wouldn't be able to get to her offices to keep them going. So she wanted her people located in a place that they could walk or bike or ride their hoverboards to, uh, to the office. So she needed to locate not only in a mixed-use area so that they'd be within dist a, a, a reasonable distance, but she also wanted to make sure it wasn't just her C-suite that was coming there. Her business couldn't operate with just the C-suite, just the corporate officers. She needed the communications folks. She needed the folks from the daycare facility. She needed the, you know, the security folks. She needed all of the key personnel to be there, which meant she needed a, a mixed-income neighborhood nearby as well. 
She also understood that when an emergency happens, even emergency oper uh, personnel won't show up and leave their family in the dark and in dangerous circumstances. So part of what she did when she had the utilities extended to monolithic, she had them extended to the neighborhood as well. That had two results. One was that when the hurricane hit, her workers knew their families were safe and they came in and continued operations. But it also made that neighborhood very attractive. So lots of people wanted to be there because there weren't comparable services around. When the hurricane hit, in fact, the neighborhood and monolithic and the buildings within the eco district were all a sort of island of operations in a sea of darkness around them. She understood one more thing, and it was really important, that there are cataclysmic events besides earthquakes and hurricanes, and they can come from social upheaval in a neighborhood. If there was a big gulf between the haves and have-nots, then small incidents could set off big problems. If crime was a problem, it was unlikely that a, a business would thrive. It might not even survive. So it was important to her that the eco district was set up to take profits from these infrastructure undertakings and use them in social programs to create social equity. But how did all of this come about? The way it happened was a bunch of people came together and created a stakeholders committee. And that stakeholders committee began to pull together small projects. And the local businesses supported them in the beginning, gave them some initial funding, and they started doing spark projects. Those were projects that sort of caught the community's eye and made them think about what could happen. Uh, different small things like uh, you know, harvesting rainwater here or beginning to grow things there. They did different forms of crowdsource funding to fund those projects. They did tactical urbanism to create things that would be temporary, that would give everybody an idea of what could happen there. And slowly but surely, the businesses started investing in infrastructure, the locality invested in infrastructure, and they attracted new utilities that came in and put their capital behind the infrastructure. And it didn't happen overnight. It took a couple of decades for them to form the eco district. But the other edge cities that didn't form eco districts found themselves the crime ridden depositories for driverless cars. And I don't know what your alternative future is, but I can promise you that if you don't start working on an eco district, that your edge city will not be where the Elliots of the future live. Good luck.